Good morning. <laughs> Hi, Lou. That was, I was just you. about to tell you. I know you caught me. Caught um, good morning, Lou. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Kim Lannon here with your daily game face on Wednesday morning at 945. I believe it's the 12th of February, maybe? I uh, think. Yes, it is. It is, right? February 12th. Um, I had and, to check. And and it's the second podcast. Yes. And and we've gone live this week, which is exciting for both of us, That's I right. think. Yeah. Um, I, I got a great amount of people last week loving the site and coming by and talking about all the cool stuff we yeah. talked about. And Brand new site, lots of likes now. Yeah. Spread it around if you're watching. Exciting. Means, spread it around. Very exciting. So, um, And I had a couple questions from people that I thought oh, I would nice. just address today. Some. Yeah. Um, A couple of people asked about, you know, sort of more about my history of like why I got into this and kind of why the sports stuff with the clinical stuff and what that means Mm -hmm. and how do you transfer that into life. And so I figured we'd spend a little time talking about that today. It's similar to what we talked about last week, but then maybe building on that a little bit. Um, And. And then I believe there were a couple questions on just how to how to not utilize the stigma of of Therapy? psych and shrinks and, oh, yeah, and yeah. being kind of more in the life coaching aspect of it and just building like a, a life skill base to yeah. have your best life like we talked about last week. So um, so going back to what I said last week around my history is growing up and doing gymnastics and being in the field and sports, it really lent myself to a phenomenon of being interested in psychology and and what moves people, what motivates people, what data motivates people, and and in gymnastics there was a lot of shaming used in coaching and yeah. and you hear a lot about that in sports in general, which we have touched on, and then sort of went through you know I could see it across the board when I was growing up of of different things with you know adults around me, um, whether it was their jobs or people having relationship issues or school teachers, and just found the fascination with clinical psychology, which is kind of the overarching. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, umbrella for everything that you do in psych that you can be able to to work with. So I'm a clinical psychologist by training and by degree, and I practice in the sports psychology consulting field, which basically is taking all the good life skill stuff that you have and putting it towards everyday life, yep. which people forget you really need to do. People kind of put in these compartments and yeah. say, oh, that doesn't matter because I'm not an athlete. Yeah. But no, that's everything not matters to motivation or to be demotivated or to be inspired or goal set or whatever. Sports makes a great um, analogy is the wrong words. Sports is a gr- sports psychology is a great illustrator of psychology in general yeah. because it's simplified. Sports are somewhat simplified and everything's quantifiable. Right. In other words, you know, you do well, you get immediate feedback and your performance, your times get better, your, right. you know, your performance gets better. You just, you know. Tangible and observable and measurable, right. which people like. Yeah, and right. life's not that way. No. Right. No. But. Plus, by the way, the uh, c- the roles of people in your life in sports are much more caricaturish. Yes. In other words, you know what your coach's role is. Yeah. You're not really sure what your boss's role is. You're not really sure what your life partner's role is, what your mother's role still is, you know? Yeah, and that's, I think that's an interesting, I mean, yes and no, because in the coaching, in the coaching realm, I mean, there's so many crossovers, but coach is a coach and that's where their boundary is supposed to be. But, you know, you would think that with your life partner and your boss and, you know, the person in the next room that's supposed to have like, you know, the equal job to you or whatever their power is or deferential, you would think that everyone would have a defined role. Yeah. But everyone crosses over onto but, each other. But your coach, right. in the end, is interested in the same thing you are. Yeah. Whether it's winning or your performance level. Right. You're working when you're working with your boss, when you're working with your uh, significant other, when you're looking working with your parents, that's not always the case. There's a no. lot of lot of needs and stuff that they're trying to fill. Yeah, as there's well. a lot more. There's a lot more agendas and and their own personal needs that need to be met yeah. for their for their own life right. issues goals. Right. Yeah. <laughs> issues. You and your coach both want the same thing. Yeah, you, usually. You may disagree how to get there, but right. you both want the same thing. Yeah. yeah. And, well, it's interesting because a lot of the athletes I work with and their coaches, they do want the same thing and they don't. Like, it, it's it's a matter of, you know, if you ask one what the goal is and you ask another, oftentimes they're not quite the same. Uh, yeah, I yeah. mean, the end goal might be to win or to get a better time if it's running or, you know, to get a gold medal and something. But the goals to get there are oftentimes a little different or right. the way of getting there, you know, the, how the coach sees it versus the right. athlete. Or what's most more important to the coach as opposed to what's more important to you. Right. The coach is looking to get a certain thing out of you and you don't think that's necessarily the thing you have to stress right at the moment. Right. Yeah. And and it's interesting because the age range in all these things, even if you're talking just straight, regular, applied kind of behavioral health, um, um, 
it, it changes based on the age range. Little kids are much more malleable to be what oh, the, yeah. the coach wants, yep. the coach gets. Whereas you start getting older in 12, 13, 14, 15, and now the self-will and the reactance and all that yeah. stuff comes in and kids want to do what they want to do. And then adults have differing ideas mm -hmm. because of their life experience that gets added in. So that's why some of the sports I work with are, are youth sports that are at high levels because, you know, the coaching uh, athlete bond is very different a lot of times than the coaching athlete bond at, at a different age. Not to say they're not going towards the same thing. But the yeah, differential changes psychologically yeah. based on the age range. Yep. You know, the power differential is a big piece into that of how it plays out yep. on the behavior that a coach gets from an athlete. Yep. Similar to a parent in a, in a lot yep. of ways. Yeah. Similar to a partner in a lot of ways, if you know, in life or friends. Yep. You know, just dependent on how you know, the, the goalposts keep is. changing. It what? The goalposts keep changing. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so, so that's basically the crossover between coming into being an athlete and then going into clinical psychology and clinical psychology is such an open field to so many yeah. things. I personally don't work in, um, you know, the more organic, you know, schizophrenia, yeah. things that are more inpatient kind of, um, long-term chronic, um, inpatient kind of hospitalization kind of issues. Right. I'm much more about people that are, um, outpatient can just do kind of life skill maintenance, want to just have a better life in general. Not that anyone inpatient doesn't, but right. it, that's a very different scenario in right. terms of how to treat. And it, it prognosis and so on this is kind of uh psychology for everyday life and uh, how to yeah. use it disorders versus life skills right yeah right yeah. and although you know there are disorders sure. it's still not it's not in the same you know i think everybody you see now has some form of anxiety oh God, what, yeah. you know yep. nervousness worry extra worry um you know, something about, I mean, as small as, you know, something spilled on my rug and it ruined my rug for, you know, towards I'm going to lose my job. Um, yeah, but that thing you spilled on your rug, that's not it for the day. Right. That's another straw on the camel's back, but it's not, you know, if someone loses it because they spilled something on the rug, it's not about the rug. No, but they think it's about the <laughs> they rug. Think it's about and the I'll hear rug. all about the rug and the, yeah, the spill exactly. for, for a whole session, you yeah. know, but it's, it is, it's what's underlying that. And that's, and, and uh, I had a client yesterday where we were talking about, um, how hard it is to get underneath the spill on the rug that the rug and the, you know, yeah. it, it's not, it's, it's kind of the, the superficial metaphor or whatever for the, the actual problem that's going on. And people have a hard time getting underneath what's swept under there. Oh, we're full of like neat little things <laughs> today. Um, but it, it, but it's really hard for people to do that because it's scary, emotionally scary, vulnerable making people don't like to do that. It, it, you know, uncovers things that maybe they're not wanting to look at that they know are there, but they don't really want to pull out and look at. And I always say, but those are the things that are going to help you change. Even if we don't full on talk about them right away, what a great piece of knowledge and self-awareness, like we talked about before that to have for someone to be able to go underneath and really say, what's driving me to be upset about the spill on the rug or what's making me unhappy today because of that. How do you feel? What's this? This sounds like a tangent, but I was thinking of this. So we were talking I about like it. Tangents. What do you think your role? What do you think the role of social media is in this? Because as, as I'm, I find myself on occasion, I transfer anger. I transfer anger to politics. Yeah. Well, yeah. yes, yeah. I, I know people that do that in my, yeah. <laughs> my client base too. Yeah. No, you, your, your day is not going well. So you're going to sit down on Facebook and just take it out on you know, whoever your political opponents are. Uh, right. <laughs> because it's socially acceptable, for one thing. Right. It's much less social, it's much less uh, vilifying than going off in your house about the spill on the rug. Exactly. Yeah. Well, you're it, an activist. You can go, you're, you're fighting for a cause. No, you're taking out your anger. And... Right. Well, and, and so the social media, there's so much to say around the behavioral health around, you know, social media because social media is a place to hide. Yeah. And what you would say on social media is a lot different for most people than you would say in person to someone. So it's a way to actually vent out those pieces that <laughs> yeah. you're, you're feeling. And, and you don't have to go after a specific person, so you don't have to be can, the bad guy. You can right, just you get can into be the... generalized and, and... You can get into the crowd of people who are like-minded and go, yeah, yeah. Group think. Yeah, yay. Exactly. Yeah. Follow, following along with the group and just and making sure that, you know, I mean, I see people post up all the time something political and then put, and take it back down because you <laughs> they put their foot out and go, oh, no. And, you know, and then yesterday I saw someone post up something and then later in the day they posted up that they had eliminated all the friends that disagreed with them for that day. <laughs> and if they were if we were getting yeah. the post, it meant we weren't, you know, 
taken out. <laughs> I pull stuff down, and people, it's it's the old thing about writing the letter that you're never going to send. Right. It's just it's just getting it out. Right. You know exactly. And you go, ah, eh, it's not worth it, or, or that's, or you realize that that's uh, transference of anger, or you realize that uh, no, I really don't want to go there right now. I got it out. I got it said. Yeah, and <clears throat> I think even if it I was think just with, to me. Well, I think it's I think it's a great venue for people to put out certain things, but you of course see the people that have the impulse control and can't stop themselves from certain going over the edge on certain things and that's that's where it becomes that problem but i mean it's a positive thing for people to use social media to be able to have their voice out there but then it also has that over the cliff right right over the cliff you know and it, ups, it upsets people i mean social media has such a draw on on the good side and the bad side for yeah. the we talk politics and psychology of politics i mean just the fact of what a what a movement uh facebook and instagram and twitter all can move the psychology of a group together so quickly yep. based on just a couple of little posts here or there. And, and, you know, whether it's, you know, something really minor or, or a little meme, it moves so fast to influence so many people in changing their minds, changing the way they feel, changing the way they'll go out and act and, and anger. I mean, people, I mean, such an anger prompter. Yeah. I think people who pull down posts, like I said, I've done it. I think it's smart on occasion. I, I oh think, yeah. I think it's 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 a sign of self awareness, and reweighing it. But talk about that in terms of uh, processing, because the I, the whole idea of therapy to yes. me, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, the whole idea of therapy and the whole idea of journaling and the whole idea of write that letter that you're never going to send, right. is that getting those thoughts and feelings down into words forces you to process them. Yes. And I remember going through therapy on several occasions and while you're answering a question and while you're thinking about the answer and putting the answer into the wor words all of a sudden going oh, i hadn't thought of this before as you're forming the thoughts right you know you are in fact processing the issues that you're dealing with so yeah so i mean the the one of the oldest techniques in the world at least as far as i know is is journaling writing and you know i mean sort of predates therapy in yep. my mind yep. um so getting things out once you put things out on paper or on Facebook or on whatever, you're you're having a processing area of your brain that you're retrieving information from that is not as filtered. You're not censoring it as much. You're just free flow or free associating of what you're writing. For most people, some people are very controlled with what they write. But yeah. usually, I say just go write whatever comes to mind, even if it's nonsensical. And and you know when people post up things like that, if we're talking specific like social media, it's such a um, cathartic experience for people and 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 to let go i actually i have to admit that last week i started to do one of those and i never do that yeah. and as soon as i was finished i deleted deleted, deleted, deleted. Yeah. because as soon as i got it out i was like oh that's bad i shouldn't put that up there yeah <laughs> because i was upset at some people that were totally miss quoting something uh, you know in a feed and i knew i had the facts and i was like at the end of it i was like okay now i feel better and it wasn't yeah. worth it so but there's so many people that don't have that filter that just click send because right. they didn't have the cathartic experience because it's it's the chaos that's inside. That It's like that's not going to fulfill them. To f it will go out, but then there's more. And, and they we have to think add. they're doing it for the outside world, but right. then you come to a certain point where you realize, oh, no, that was just for me. Right. And then that's when you don't send or that's when you delete. Right. You know, like, right. Well, you know, first of all, that's not going to land. I can't control what they think. I can't control that opinion. Right. And why am I why am I putting myself out there? You know, that that was just for me. To right. Get through. Well, and I often I often will tell people about like these types of things is like once you get it out there, especially people are so vulnerable, you know, they they present very well and they have no real anxiety looking outside. But then they put themselves out there like that and all of a sudden they don't expect what they're going to get back. Oh, yeah. And then, then it's the, cru you know, it's the ego crush, the crush to the reality of, wait a second, I was making a point. I feel like I was right. And how can this person attack me? And right. they don't have the, the short up around edges to actually yeah. manage the, the hit that they get back. That's, that's not nice or mean spirited or attacking. Yeah. And, and I warn people, I'm like you opening the door for an emotional, hit that you may not be willing ready and able to take and yeah. people do it yeah and then they afterwards they're you know shell shock of oh i shouldn't have done that and yeah. how could that person do that and then they deflect it like it's them and i'm like well you put yourself out there that's my job and if and you it's didn't brutal. put yourself out yeah then you know that's my job and I, i've been doing it for a number of years but it's still brutal 
Yeah. You have to be prepared for it. So what? So what? So how do you prepare for it? Because I have techniques I give to people, but since it's part of your job, like what do you do to? It's more an to me. It's more of an acceptance deal. Yeah. It's like I know, you know, I know when I say this what I'm going to get. Right. And you just you know, just deal with it. But if you have the courage of your convictions, if it's well thought out, if it's not an angered response, right. if it's not an impulse response, right. You know, just I've been doing talk radio for. 20 plus years now yeah. it's a be careful what you say or, right. or just believe in what you say that's right. all yeah just I, I have to control those impulses all the time just to say things that i'm feeling at the moment and and i think i think that that's i mean such a you i mean know, if i believe it i'm willing to say it i'm willing to stand up and i'll take the heat but it, and i think i want to make sure what i say is what i meant to say and what i actually believe in it wasn't just an angered response and that's such a grounded a grounded experience that so many people don't have and and so that goes to the technique that i i use which is you know the best response often is no response and <laughs> because if it's going to come from an emotional place it's a reaction yep. and reactions are going to go into that opening you up for whatever's coming right. versus if you have a response, reaction versus response. If you're responding to something, man, you're in such a much better space because you, you have belief in where you're coming from. Even if someone disagrees with you, right. you've held the emotional spot, uh, spot back here and put what you feel is fact, which reasonable, rational, realistic out on the front. And then people, you know, people that can... doesn't save you from much, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, pe for the most part, right? So yeah. people can So people can attack it all they want, but you can feel like if it's something you believe in strongly you yeah. don't have to you're not going to get into it it's i think it's when people get in and this is even when people do communication one-to-one -one, when people are starting to really talk to each other um they don't talk with responses they talk out of the reaction of the of the feeling and the emotion that yeah. you know come i i mean i have to i mean human being i work on that all the time of checking the emotion knowing that oh that's there and i'm going to probably act on that and knowing when uh oh i've overreacted and now i got to come back and do a response yeah. you know not in my practice yeah but. <laughs> here's the key for me this is an important litmus test yes. for me always has been i remember uh for years i would always uh, i would always uh, chew on the question of what do i make happen and what do i let happen mm -hmm. and that's a, that was a real struggle for me for a lot of times because because i felt being young and not so young but still naive i felt that i could control everything i right. can make everything happen and that acceptance of what you can control and what you can't control and the difference between am i doing this am i saying this for me or am i saying this trying to change somebody right once you let go of the fact that you can't change people you can put it out there this is what i believe in as opposed to this is what you should do that's a big difference and that's a, that's a very common probably one of the biggest things that i see and almost everyone i see or talk to even just in interpersonal relationships is you know it gives you a sense of it it gives you the illusion or sometimes the delusion of control that if you account for all these things if you make sure that you've covered all the bases and you and you're controlling everything that your anxiety will come down essentially because yeah. people are in such a state of anxiety that sometimes they don't even know it but they're doing that in an effort to control because they believe everything in their lives happens to them right as opposed to them having any control or any choice over it exactly yeah. yes it you know you did this to me it's happening to me. It happened to me instead of like, I made a choice to be part of this. You know, I often will yep. say to um, clients, um, what, what part of this was your part? Yeah. And it's, and it's, it's interesting because yeah, I get, I get great answers a lot of the time because people can be self-reflective and open and vulnerable. But man, I get a lot of people who just, I, I didn't do anything. I have no part in it. Yeah. <laughs> There's, this isn't me. This is outside of me externalizing. And we are a very big culture of externalizing, um, you know, like it's not my fault. Yeah. Um, it's somebody else. Yeah. Of course, uh, you know, when it's a good thing, it's all me. Right. <laughs> you know, it's success. You know, success. It's I did it. But when it's not going well, it's you, them, they, the right. world. Um, so uh, coming Comes down to your part in it, the very minimal, your minimal part in it is that you engaged. Yeah. Right? Exactly. And oftentimes, more often than you think, yes. you, you have the choice not to engage. Right. So if you're in this, part of it is you just from the standpoint of you took it on. Yeah. You know, Absolutely. You stood and, up and got involved. Right. But, you know, so when people... And obviously the stuff you can't afford. You have to get involved in some stuff. I understand that. Right. But a vast majority of what we are engaged with and irritated by is we took on. 
we decided exactly. to get involved. Well, it's interesting because one of the, I mean, it's many things about that is interesting, but like when you're talking about parenting and kids, you have yeah. kids, yeah, right? So when, when they're little, this is, you know, when they're little and, yeah. you know, they, everything is happening to them and, you know, they don't have the sense of control that they want and they push the buttons, they push the envelope, you know, they're trying to separate, individuate, get their whole thing. Which is uh, largely true when they're young. What? Uh, which is largely true when yeah. they're young. A lot is happening to them. Right. And so so what they learn in that youth time that, you know, is sort of zero to six and seven and eight years old is how to gain a sense of their own independence of of, of whose fault, whose consequence Hopefully. in that whole developmental area. Consequence is the word. Right. I think I've always thought that the first job of a parent is to attach consequence to action. Right. And... You know, they're young. You don't give them total control, but you give them control over some stuff. Right. So that, that when they do the right thing and get a good consequence, they understand they had a little control over that situation. They always should be invested in the situation a little bit. That doesn't mean you let them run the show. Right. But it's an what I call it is age appropriate investment, you know, right. so that you give so that the child is a certain age. They have a, they have the amount of choice. I always say to parents, give them two choices that end in your favor. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. You know, so they have a choice. You know, when you're mm -hmm. dealing with young, young kids. They, you know, to, to build their self-confidence so they don't have a, the trouble looking inward or right. having self-awareness issues or independence or self-control issues, to have them always give them two choices. Yep. But they're going to end in a favor that's going to benefit both the child and the parent. So it gives them a sense of control. Right. And, and that leads to less anxiety over time. I mean, there's other factors too, but I find that that's one of the biggest factors when I see more teenage and adult clients that that piece is missing, that they don't feel like they have control. Yeah. Like an eating disorder, for instance, that's all about control. I mean, I'm simplifying it here, yeah. but that's about control. You know, yeah. a child, you know, a 13 year old child in the house is, is restricting their eating. And then by and large, you see tons of control issues in the house. Right. Either. And people think controlling is just the, the tyranny of a parenting or, or the, you know, the authoritarian. And it's not always that right. it's also the over indulgence and the over permissive smothering of a child who is feeling like they're just you know yeah. helicoptered over and loved over over right. over and that just creates that i don't have any control or sense of control in my life yeah frustration but, and anxiety comes from unknown and lack of control yeah basically yes and the biggest disconnect i see in parenting these days and it's a, such a subtle thing but it's so important is that you try to avoid punishing the kids at all costs. What right. you do is you put them in a consequence situation. Right. In other words, you're not watching TV right now not because I'm punishing you. You're not watching TV right now because you didn't do what you needed to do to watch TV. Right. It's them. It's not you punishing them. It's not happening to them. It's a, it's choice a result that they made. of their yeah. It's a choice it's a they made. Of their that, and that's such a hard thing. And that's and that's what I was saying. Um, that I just had this conversation with someone yesterday about the fact that the parent doesn't like to give a consequence. They like to do a natural consequence, which is nothing wrong with. Like if a kid says, I don't want to wear a jacket and it's 14 degrees yeah. out. Okay, don't wear a jacket. That's a consequence, but it's not the same thing as if, you know, your child won't um, go to bed and screams for an hour and a half and is maneuvering you all night long and you keep going in and engaging and going back yeah. and going back. And, and at the end of the day, you didn't put any consequences around that or, you know, guidelines or structure because you don't want to get them upset or you all these pieces that come into play yeah. and it really has it's such an importance for children and adults to have that structure or to have what's consistent to be able to know that there's a there's no need for control it's just here's the structure right. and um and that in that one per, particular an, uh, instance yesterday um oftentimes the mother finds that the child hits her and I said, there's always a consequence for hitting. Yeah. And the consequence is, you know, intermittently changing. It's one day it might be no dessert. One day it might be no uh, TV, no screen time. Um, and you give it age appropriate. If the child's five years old, then it's, you know, you know, maybe the first offense, the first hit, you say no, you give a half an hour, no screen time. Then it, if it's getting worse, it's a whole day. Right. She had, and but this is, you know, now I've got the little kid and the mom and they're having difficulty. And isn't the key to that, doing it without passion yeah in other words if you do it with pa if you react strongly and angrily 
and say, you can't watch TV for half an hour, you're right. punishing them. Right. That's emotional engagement. That's exactly what they're looking for. Right. And that's exactly what you don't reward them with. Right. You just very calmly said, okay, we're not, we're not dealing with that. It, I, I would always tell parents uh, when they were facing situations, like, what if your kid came up to you at night and said, I'm not brushing my teeth tonight? You wouldn't get angry at him. you say, what are you nuts? Go brush your teeth. And it was very dispassionate. It's just matter of fact. Right. This is it. Right. This is action and consequence. Right. It doesn't have it doesn't have an emotional right. hook for you, and therefore they don't see the reaction. So there's no need to pursue because they're hitting you. Yeah. In this case, they're hitting you to get a reaction. Exactly. Kids love if they can't get positive. Uh, if they can't get positive response, they'll take negative. They go right response. to the negative. Yeah. Right. And they love it. They're they're in on it. I I was I was just looking down at the screen, Lou, for a second. I have um. Uh, Jesse just wrote in and said, thank you for all you do, Kim. She is a wonderful running uh, buddy of mine that runs in the community, and she's running the Boston Marathon. And, uh, nice. And, uh, and she's a great supporter, and she's an awesome person. She's here in the Merrimack Valley, so a little shout-out to her for saying that. I admire you people can run the marathon. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we're, we're both running it together. So, yeah. so we both run for different charities. So, um, but yeah, she's so thank you, Jesse, for, for chiming in. Thank you. And my husband, actually, my husband, there we go. He, he wrote in too. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Thanks, John. John. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this brings us back around to the whole, um, your part in whatever's going on, because when you're raised that way and you don't understand actions have consequences, you don't understand your role in right. what's going on around you. Right. And you don't understand you have a role, and some people are stumped by that. But the fact is, and it doesn't mean you're wrong or they're right. It, it just means you have a part in this that you can change. You right. have some levers to pull. You have some control over the situation. Right. Whatever the situation. Again, it varies. You know, listen, your boss does something to you. You have, you have to eat. You need the check. You right. Know, you do what you have to do, and you deal with it. But right. So if, so your if you're mother's talking... giving you a hard time. You know, you're an adult, and your mother's giving you a hard time. You don't necessarily have to engage. You can right. come to a different. Re you can come to a different relationship with that whole dynamic. And it's interesting how many people feel compelled to engage. Yep. You know, oh, and sure. and it's it's often you know, in my experience, it's the it's the, um, it's the pattern and the dynamic that's been set up between the people from a long, long time yep. ago. That it's just engaging is the norm, especially and adult children and parents. Yes. Yeah, that's, yes. That's, that's, and a that's a well-worn path. Oh yeah, and and I see that a, a lot. And and breaking breaking that pattern is so difficult because that impulse to engage and but I have to say this back or I have to get one more word in or yeah. she can't be right or that's so wrong. It, it's just and and my my response, you know, to some clients will be like, just don't respond. Yeah, and it's that wide eye. What do you mean, don't respond? I'm like, you don't have to respond. Yeah. And that's so foreign to people. Like, what do you mean I don't have to respond? I'm like, you don't have to respond to that. Well, and then it's, well, they're going to be angry. Okay. Yeah. So you have to be able to sit with being, someone being mad at you, but that's not the end of the world if someone's mad. And, and if they don't talk to you and they're a parent and they stop talking to you because they're mad, that's going to give you a whole other litany of information about what's going yeah, on. Yeah, but that's not going to happen either because right. the reason they're they're poking the bear right so to speak is to keep connection and to keep keep engagement right yeah. and and that and that in in many instances goes to that whole um codependency yeah. cycle and and that's such a um i don't know how much of the mainstream it's mainstream for me because i use it so much in all my work because i think that the lack of connection that happens in in people's lives that make them have these anxieties and feelings of depression and feelings of worry come so much from um, dynamics of codependency and it's not what I would consider the old school kind of way of looking at codependency yeah. it's really about you know we all strive for connection yeah. and then once we get it no matter how it's going back to that little kid scenario of, you know I'd rather have bad attention than no attention so I'll keep getting mm -hmm. it and keep keep you in the in the in the pool with me yeah. and so there's that there's that system and to break that system is so difficult to, yeah. to set that boundary, to hold it, and to, to be okay with that, mm -hmm. you know, and I see that, and that's one of the things that comes up in a lot of my athletes, you know, you, you know, even my pro player, top of the line elite athletes, it's not always the sport, it's the family dynamic or right. whatever's playing out, usually in something of these little topics that we're talking about combined that are making something happen. Yeah, and isn't the base of this, again, correct me if I'm wrong, isn't the base of this codependency is 
the result of not having a strong enough self. Yeah. You know, it's to be dependent on someone else. The ideal here is not to be dependent on someone else. You want people in your life. You want you want connection. Right. You want a spouse. You want a partner. You want that type of relationship. But it's important that you don't need it. You know. Right. So you don't, you want to you want to have. I always say that you want to have. Depend. You want to depend on people, but you don't want to be dependent. You want to have interdependence. You know the you know the strongest people in the world have people to depend on, but they're not dependent right. on them. So you know there's people that lift you up, but if you're relying on them, and then the relying on people are then relying on you. You know I need right. you to need me to need you. <laughs> then it's that there's not enough of a boundary separation to be aware of your own space and and then you get drawn in right and the major symptom one of the major symptoms of that is identification in other words um yes. this is a uh this is a low level example but you know i'm a jeep guy i've owned jeeps on my life i kind of self-identify right so i drive a jeep whether i should be driving a jeep or not whether it's practical for me or not and it, right. on occasions it hasn't because that's how i ident identify and that's just that's un an unhealthy situation it's well, all right to drive a jeep if you want to drive a jeep but you shouldn't be driving it if it's not practical and it's not right it's because of the image that you or right. the 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 um dialogue that you've told yourself about what is supposed to be for you or right. what you expect that other people are expecting of you to yeah. to be in the world when i became a parent i went from a wrangler because you can't have a wrangler with kids to a cherokee i had to have a jeep it may not have been the best choice that car may, may not have been the best choice but i identified with it we see this in relationships yep right Yes. I have to be in a relationship or I'm a wife or I'm a mother or I'm Jim's wife. It's like there's got to be a self there. Well, and so I, I know. And so what happens when a relationship has a problem or a relationship ends, it's that death of self. Yes. And you feel lost. And you because, feel... Right, because it's the it's that piece of you. So we talk about the ego strength or the you know, the, the self esteem piece mm -hmm. that that cuts away from you because you've become so reliant on that person being one with you. You know, I I am you, you are me, we right. are one, which is yeah. not healthy. And that's that's a very common I think probably one of the biggest problems relationally that I see is people becoming so in in interdependent to right. the point where they cross over into I am one you you know we are together right. and it's all about I can't function without a person with me um, I even have teenagers now that will come in and they'll have their breakup at 15 years old yeah. and they'll say no one will ever love me again you know and yep. I cringe from them inside saying you know that feeling because that feeling's valid for them yeah. because right there they're telling you so much about but a 15 year old is so lost in their world so often right when they have a partner a lot of the attention goes there a lot of their self goes there right so the um losing that relationship is just going back into that real struggle of being a 14 to 15 year old and being yeah and being on one's own and having to sit with that whole separation yeah. and individuation that's going on and who am i i mean 14 15 16 17 is those years of who am I? Who do I want to be? Who yeah. likes me? Who doesn't like me? Where do I fit in? And Most then people all this... think they're losing at 14 or 15. Yeah. But they find Life someone is... who wants to be a girlfriend or wants to be a boyfriend. Right. And all of We're a sudden, I'm married. winning with this person. Yeah. We're, We're going to get married. We're going to get married. Yeah. We're going to be together forever. And then yeah. they break up. And yeah. And that, and that, and so that goes to the ego. And you find that kids who have that struggle more inside internally to their reality manager of like, what is, what is, you know, what, who am I? Yep. That when they do have those breakups or they have the split ups or the friend doesn't like them anymore, you see the person that has more codependency issues really right. struggle with that. Yep. The person, you know, and, the, and that leads them, I know you do shows here, you know, um, also about addiction. Right. Those are the, those are the relational issues that lead people down the road of, you know, and addiction comes in all forms and sizes, whether right. it's an eating disorder, um, you know, uh, binge eating, gambling, yep. sex, drugs, alcohol, shopping, shopping, yeah. over exercising. You know, yep. those are all pieces that kind of, not even kind of, they 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 supply the energy for a person's codependency to seek out more of what they were in mm. that will, and again, break up with them. So yep. you know, in these in that scenario or not work for them. This can happen with a job. It can also happen with, um, and you must see it all the time, it, it, it has to happen in sports. Yes. There has to be a death of self. You, you identify as an athlete, you identify as an elite athlete, and there's a time when you, you either find out 
that you can't make the next level or you find out or, or you just you age out of it. Right. You know, you can't be that elite athlete anymore. So, and so all of a sudden you've got to be the person. Well, so great, great transition about that into athletes. Um, so when I was a gymnast, mm -hmm. I mean, gymnast females, when I was doing gymnastics, really tapped out and were done by the, before they were 18. Yeah. So I had a full, you know, right? Yeah. Yep. I had a full-time job before I was 18, all done, and then started life. You know, that's, you, people often would say, you, you had a, a full-time job and a career yeah. before you yeah. were 18. And before kids even got off the couch to do a sport, I was... Yep. Um, a more involved career than most people have, have for careers. Right, yeah. right. So that is a common experience for Athletes who start young, like Tiger Woods, uh, Serena and Venus Williams, you know, K Michael Phelps, they all started young yep. for the most part, right? So they come up through and you get you get to their adulthood and their life has been the sport. Yep. It's been everything. Their parents are involved. Their, yep. Everything is that sport. And, and one of the big issues that I see in athletes when they come in is the retirement at 22 mm -hmm. or the football injury that now may put someone out of the lineup for the next season for possibly going on for yep. life in the pros. Yep. Um, and now the question is, now what am I going to do? Right. And Who am I? And who am I? If I'm not that person, and I'm who not, am I? Right, yeah. because there's nothing, there's nothing else there for them to do, and they don't even have, you know, like a skill to back up or to think about, or, and and so when I go in and talk to like high schools or um, middle schools, I often talk to the coaches and parents and the students about, hey, you want to be these things, make sure you have some really fun hobbies, make sure you have some interests, make sure you're doing other things, and I do that as a, as a way. You know, I talk to high schoolers more about it, literally right down the line. But with younger kids, it's just, you know, you want to have other things. Yeah. You want to have something to fall back on to have fun with, it, you know, in case you get hurt or in case something happens. Because, I mean, I, I can't tell you how many athletes I've seen that, you know, have a football injury, a back injury, for instance, or a neck injury. And, you know, the next thing they're laid up on the couch for whatever time they the doctors give them a little medication. Now they got a little addiction going. Now they're struggling. Now they get depressed. Yep. Right. Yep. Right. And, and now it's OK. Now what am I going to do? But the world is working against that whole right. thing because kids these days, if they play at any kind of level with athletics, they're in AAU, AAU they're on year-long teams, it's a year-long right. program, it demands their full attention. Right. And parents are much more willing to go along with this now because of scholarships. Right. You need to help me out, you need to help me put you through college, you need to work, you need to get the scholarship. And it just it becomes difficult, but it's not even necessarily high level athletes. No. I, I remember last week I told you it's like I had all these principles in athletics and couldn't bring them to real life. I was a decent athlete when I was a kid, and you can't continue to do that. But the reason I could apply this as an athlete is because I was a good athlete right. and I had confidence in myself. Right. When the athleticism is gone, when I can't get out of work and go play softball, right? You know, I can't golf, right? Then know, what? What am I doing? Right. Yeah. That's when I felt good because I had confidence in myself there. In this part of the world, in the real world, less so. When you have to, when you have to really be in the world. Well, so yeah. that's that's similar to the same. You cross over into people who are retirement age, right? So, yeah. the same the same kind of applies that people who are coming into the retirement age, it, people have this all the time. They they're getting ready for retirement and they go into retirement and six months later. Now we have bouts of depression and we yeah. have stuff going on that because they didn't have a hobby. They were a workaholic or they were completely invested in what they were doing. The family was taken care of. They were their job. They were their job. Yeah. And now it's what do I do? Um, so it, it's interesting. When I first started doing this many, many years ago, I worked at a hospital and worked on a geriatric floor, yep. a special care unit, and um, and also in the outpatient unit. And oftentimes the people were just into their just into their retirement age years, and that would be a common theme. Yeah. That same as the athlete thing is like, okay, now what do I do? And now my whole identity is changed, skewed. Who am I? I have no purpose. I have no sense of self. How do I get forward? And it's my my advice is always generate as many alternatives as you can and try lots of things. And 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 if you can, if you know, and you know, this is coming. You know, athletes are a little bit different because they don't know it's necessarily coming. But in retirement, for instance, it's you know it's coming in X amount of years. It's probably time you start yeah. picking up some other things so that you know when you are done you have something to fill your time and because yeah. that's a complete 
aspect change. Yeah. It's, it's not just pick up a hobby. Right. You got to change the way you think. And it's hard <laughs> to do it on demand and it's hard to do it in the duress of, of the retirement. How many times have we seen people, you, maybe you've worked with people, I've worked with people, I go, when that guy retires, he'll live about six more months. Yep. Because this is what's driving him. Yep. And you know, that that's fine and it's good. Or how many times have you seen a spouse, someone lose a spouse and, and then, then six months later they're gone? They pass away, right. Because they have, there's no existence for them beyond the spouse or beyond that because work. they were codependent yeah you know and not in a negative i don't say no. that in a negative way it's just that the connection in that in those cases is so strong that people die of heartbreak or people die of of uh, you know that loss issue of not being able to function on their well, own without they're looking person. at the abyss right Anyway. They're looking at the abyss. Yes. There's nothing. This right. person is gone. What is there? What's left? Now, me? so here's an interesting an interesting point on, on research that we know that, you know, sort of backs up this with the difference between gender of male and female. So if a male dies in the marriage first, a female is more likely to live an okay. extended amount of time. Yeah. And if a female dies, the male is more likely to have that six month or year mark right. to pass away. And the research around that and the anecdotal studies that have been done are pretty amazing around the psychology of of how women are much more because of the nurturing nature and having to right. take care of and having the you know the the marathon mindset of being able to go the distance right. um, and not having the codependent um, hooks in as much as maybe the male counterpart that, that socialized into to child rearing and, and getting the relationships going that makes such a difference i find that yeah incredibly fascinating i'm guessing that's going to trend away from that though it well so it is trending away from that a little bit um but it's still it's, it's still there i mean because there's so many my parents generation the, the father got up went to work that was the extent of what he did right i went up worked got the check okay you know and the wife did everything else. Right. You know, or did all the nurturing. There's right. no nurturing involved. They get up and I work and I bring home the check. Right. You know, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. That's the way life was structured back then. Right. But, right. you know, males today, the male part of a relationship or a marriage, it's less so. Right. And and that's going to, and I, you can see that's going to shift. There's like a midsection between like the boomers and like, you know, the mm -hmm. Gen Xers and, and, and everything coming up. There's a section in there that's probably going to do a little plateauing, I think, mm -hmm. if, if, psychological predicting can be there and then and then i'm not sure what's going to happen with because there's so much dependency now in the younger generation psychologically on so many things to hold hands that you know i in, 10 years ago i would have kids in my office that knew how to do their laundry cook for themselves you so on and so forth yep. and now i have kids that have no idea how to do that yeah and and they're coming back from college at 24 and living at the home until they're 29 and 30 years old which you know understandable for like money reasons and so on and so forth but what a dynamic shift of yeah. you know and they're in relationships and that you know it's like they're living at home they're in relationships with a significant other they want to get married but they're not moving out of their homes and creating a life because they're still separated out yep you know or one is living in their own place and the other one's still living at home but they're 30. Yep. And what you know, and they still feel that connection in for a variety of reasons, and some some very healthy and good, but many times not so good right. because it it's creating this new what I would consider like a new pattern of of codependency. So <laughs> if, if we can sum up the main part of this, this is probably a good second episode subject too. Yeah, the main goal here is to build a self. Yes, the, the main goal here. Or as it says, a happier, healthier living, is to have a sense of self. Right. Things get, and it's the old working on yourself, and everybody rolls their eyes when, yes. when you say working on themselves. But everything <clears throat> comes easier, everything works better, the anxiety is a lot less. You draw better people into your life. Right. At that point, you draw better situations into your life if you have a sense of self. Right. Where and you're not just putting up with problems because you feel like you have to. Because, right, because the, you're not worth the resistance. With your mother, yeah, you got to feel like, okay, I understand who she is and how she reacts, but by the same token, I'm an adult now, right? And I've got things to take care of, so I'm taking care of myself, right? Which means I'm not picking up that phone call or I'm not engaging in this argument, right? And it's like, all right, Mara, I'll talk to you next. I'll talk to you in a couple of days, right? And being able to so with a strong sense of self, and I was just going to say, so that means to have a, a good, a good base of your reality of what is really 
really true what's going to happen so if i say i'm not picking up the phone or i don't have time right now that if my mom or my whoever gets mad or upset or something isn't going in the favor that i'm okay yeah. that it's not the end of the world and that starts from childhood yep. teaching children how to be uh, better managers of their own reality and not giving them a false sense of reality and that's super hard because you see so many different styles of parenting and so many ways of doing that. And by the time you get adults and athletes and people in my door at adult age, that piece of self is, yeah. you know, has um, injuries to it. You know, little yeah. little spots of like, you know, getting hit here and there. And the more damaged the sense of self, obviously, the more issues we have. You know what I, know what I processed while we were talking about this? <laughs> if your mother tells you you're essentially not in so many words but they normally do it they'll tell you you're worthless and selfish yeah. or your spouse spouse tells you you're worthless and selfish the only reason that works is because you believe it that's right right, right. so you have got to you've got to establish the fact no i'm not worthless and selfish may not selfish i'm not this everything i'm doing might not be working out perfectly for you right. but it's not because i'm worthless and selfish right, and, that's and the worthless thing there's a billion ways for somebody to tell you you're worthless you may be worthless to them but right. that doesn't mean you're worthless. Right. Yeah. And but but when you have, I should say, and when you have someone that's been told you're a failure, you're you're worthless, you're no good, you're never going to be anything, you know, you're yeah. ridiculous, all those bad tapes that go in the head. There, that happens so much to to imprint that on the the brain and the neurology and the brain to keep it there. That that's what becomes the norm. So to break that habit when you introduce something like an alternative thought process, to yeah. like you know you. You know what makes what makes that true for you? Why are you saying you're worthless? What are the facts about that? I get the silence because yeah. there's no fact, and that's kind of that first process of, of uh, first step in the process of generating the different mindset that you were just talking about to be able to say, I really, I really never thought of it like that, or I've just always believed what I was told because that's yeah. what I know. Exactly. You know, yeah. I know what I know and I it, must be because everybody tells, tells me, I, me am. I am. And therefore because now the it's fact, who I am. The fact that you're open to that attracts people who are going to right. keep you in that condition because they like you in that condition. Right. And that's a common right. question that people yeah. ask me is like why do people repeat, you know, if they grew up in an abusive household, why do they end up in abusive relationships? And there's there, there's the yeah. answer. I mean, it's small in a nutshell, but it's, you know, a little this bit more. This is what I deserve. Right. This is what I deserve. This is what I know. There's nothing different, you know. And if there is something different, I'm not going to trust that because I don't know that. And yeah. that's not, at least I'd rather dance with the devil I know than the devil I don't because I don't know what that other thing is. And that could backfire. At least I know what I'm going to get here. Yeah. And you know? from how many times do you see people psycho relationships? They always date the same person. Yeah. And they always end up in the same relationship. Yes. And it's because of, it's because of what they think of themselves. It's right. not because it, they just attract that type of person. You know, in many cases, recreating the home, the childhood home, because this is what I know. Right. 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 This they, is what they, I deserve. This is what I know. Right. They go back and re, they recapitulate the family of origin issues. That's yeah. what we say. They, they repeat the family of origin issues without even knowing it's all subconscious and unconsciously in there, you know, until you get someone, you know, that can do it on their own and say, oh, I know that pattern. But by and large, I mean, people that walk in my door don't see the pattern until we start unraveling the pattern. Or they know something's there, but they don't know how deep that pattern is, that yeah. it would be so um, paralyzing to their life. And yeah. their li they can't live the you can't live your best life if that, that piece of your self-esteem is just constantly being sat on. Right. And people live like that all the time. Yeah. And yeah. that's why... That's but your part in that is choosing to stay in those relationships, engage in those conversations, uh, give it some validity. Right. That, that's your part in it. Right. And, mm -hmm. and so... And We're that a healthy is... person. If your mother goes off on you, you go, you're selfish. You, sh you should be over here. You should be doing this. Right. It's like a healthy person understands I'm doing what I can. Right. I have other responsibilities right. too. And, and holding yeah. that boundary. Yeah. And being able to do that. And that doesn't necessarily mean engaging and fighting with your mother over right. it. It means hanging up the phone and going on with the rest of your day. Right. Without and not, living and not with feeling that. guilty about it. Yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> right. And I don't mean necessarily hanging up on her. It's just like, okay, right. mom, just, I'll I, talk go. to you tomorrow. Right. And not carrying that forward into what else you have to do because, right. you know, no, she's, you know, her perspective is skewed. Right. You know, I'm not worthless and selfish. Her perspective, her perspective is. If I yeah, yeah, if I don't do that, it doesn't mean I'm worthless and selfish, which is the way that you've gotten me to not do it in the first place, right. or to do it in the first place. And yeah. and so what you were just saying before about how you know people think about themselves like that, 
people don't make that flip in their heads oftentimes because they don't know how. Yeah. And it's not because they're not capable. It's just that people really... That's, how, that's what I was going to ask. How do we just, go about this? They just yeah. don't know how to do it. They don't even know. I mean, most people don't even know that there is another how. It's just they, they succumb to the, this is my life. This is what it is. Yeah. And there might be something out there, but I have no idea what it is or how to get there. And But it's it's then saying... Like what you were just saying, generating an alternative of like, you know, you can you can say, I love you. I'm going to hang up now and I got to go and and being yep. OK with that and knowing that you can be in charge of your own life. And that doesn't mean that you're not a good person or you're a good child or a good parent if you're doing a boundary. Yeah. And and but that's that's a convincing thing of oneself to say, oh, I survived this, because oftentimes you get that that reinforcement from a parent who says, if you don't do this, I won't love you. Or, right. if you, do, you know, yeah. if you do this, I'll love you. The unconditional versus the conditional love environment that creates yeah. the pain of being able to say, I need to set a boundary. You know, and yep. then and then when the child or the adult child sets a boundary, the feedback is like, I, I don't like that. You know, I don't like it when you act like that. And, yeah. then, and then the child goes back to being small because the parent has that much as an adult over them, even if they're an adult. Yeah, but so if you need to do it, you're worth it. Right. Yeah. So you have to, so therapy or life skill coaching or doing what I do helps people generate an idea of how to see the pattern, see what part they're doing in the pattern, and then how it impacts their life and change it by yeah. just generating some alternatives to how to handle a different situation. And sometimes it's just as easy as don't react, respond. Yeah. Just respond. We talked in the first episode about how awareness is so important because it leads to changes. And one of the things that you need to become aware of, everyone thinks if you if you get off the phone with your mother <clears throat> and she's belittled, belittled you and called into question your value, um, you often accept that as truth. That's right. just abstract truth. Right. It's not abstract truth. It's the sum of her influences what's going on right. in her life <clears throat> excuse me in her perspective right and that's important to understand too it's like you're not worthless because she says you're worthless right you're worthless because she's dealing with some other things and needs something from you and isn't getting what she needs and that's and that's the frame of reference that the 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 person has is if that's what they were raised with all their life and now they're an adult they are people become accepting of that even though they know it feels bad and they know right. it's not right the mother can get away with it because it's one, the status of being a mother. Um, you know, the mother is the authority. The mother is the, is the authority, authority, right? right. Yeah. And, and we, everyone's supposed to respect your mother or mm -hmm. your father or whatever. And I was just telling my class last week, I said, you can love your mother and father just because they're your mother and father doesn't give them the right to run right. you over. And you can love them, but sometimes you have to love them from afar. <laughs> and when you were young and you were a kid, what they were telling you was the truth. Right. It was your whole, it was right. your whole existence. Right. Nowadays, Until you have that moment in your teenage yeah. years where you're like, wait a second, yeah. <clears throat> that's not right. <laughs> when you start seeing them as people and you start seeing their perspectives and the things that are, are haunting them, the right. thing, things that, are, that they're struggling right. with. And as the parents get older, you see that more and more. You see them as people. And hopefully you add that into the equation of your interaction. Right. And so, by the way, the people are getting older. They're getting more vulnerable. They're getting more uncertain. Again, right. the unknown, they're dropping control. Right. Right. They'll have less and less control over their lives. Right. Unknown and lack of control. That's what right. leads to frustration and anger. Right. And they're dealing with it more and more as they get older. Right. Because the independence piece, all those factors that go into being an independent human being yeah. now are. Your mother may not like depending on you. So when she doesn't get what she depends on you for, and again, depend is a grade scale. Right. Doesn't mean she's going to die if you right. don't come over this right. afternoon. Right. But she needs a little bit more from you. And when she doesn't get it, she gets frustrated. Right. And she lashes out. Right. And it, it's not because you're not doing enough. It's because she's not getting what she needs. She's not getting and what, what she, she wants. Yeah. Oftentimes it's what they want. A person wants, you know, yep. we won't, we won't pick on just moms, but it's just like when yeah. a person doesn't get what they want, you know, that that overrides everything oftentimes with with inappropriate or boundary crossing behaviors or hurtful behaviors to other people because it's a maneuver which is also a coping strategy you know people say it's manipulation i call it a coping strategy you know if you're yeah, if you're both. maneuvering yeah. something to get somebody to get you, what you want and no matter what and even if it's hurtful you'll still get what you want because you're getting it by you know, emotional warfare or right. you're giving a consequence that's painful to someone in some way just to get what you want versus having that separated self going, I can't always get what I want and it's okay. Right. And 
that's hard. That separate itself doesn't believe what everybody tells them. That's right. And understands that there's other influences. And uh, again, if you want to use the word manipulation, if you want to use the word coping, other people's interactions with you are the sum of what's going on in their lives. And their lives, absolutely. So when they tell you something, when they're not happy with you, when they're calling you inadequate in whatever, whatever way they're doing right. it, it's not necessarily the truth. It's right. their perspective. Right. And being aware of that, at least, that it's not the truth. In other words, I'm guessing most people have self-esteem issues, and I was there too, was because um, they'll give you the answer because that's what everybody's always told me. That's right. That's what and I've I, always experienced. And that's exactly, that's, well, yeah. that's what I've always known. That's what people tell me. So that's the truth. Right. No, it's not the truth. It's just the sum of their perspective. Right. right. And when you challenge that, which is what I do, I'll say, yeah. to generate that perspective that's different, I'll say, you know, what is it about that that's true? You know, if someone says, I'm a failure, I'm like, okay, well, tell me, tell me how you're a failure. In what way? A fact. And there's that silence. Yeah. And, but people will come up with stuff. And I'm like, oh, but sure. that's not fact. Because it, it's not fact. It's it's always, well, because, well, because the give me a are scenario in... and it's like, well, that's not yeah. a failure. That's that's a learning experience or that's, yeah, it was, it didn't end up in, as you winning or that didn't end up with you with an A, it was a D. That's not, that's, you you use the experience to learn. It's not a, it's not the death sentence. Nobody died at the end of the day. Nobody f- blew up in flames. Right. You know, you know, it's not the worst case scenario. But they've been, that person's been taught that, if it's not perfect or if it's not what the other person expects, that it's a failure or right. it's terrible. That must mean they're bad, they're terrible, awful people. Yeah, if you're not – because a lot of people aren't aware of their own reactions right. to this as well. So if you're not sacrificing yourself totally to their needs and their perspectives, you're inadequate. Right. But that's not, that's not the that's truth. that's not true. Right. Everybody – You've got to balance a bunch of needs. By the way, including your own, nobody rosters their own needs. Right. And, right. and, and going with the aspect that – that's the biggest You're gift I've given enough. myself the last few years. Yeah, that's, and it's a great gift because people have such a hard time giving themselves that. Just as simple as, you know what, I need a night. Right. I'm just going to go home and sit tonight. Right. And just taking that space and, and regrouping. And, and being about you. Yeah. And, being, and knowing that you're good enough yeah. and you deserve it and that you don't have that to do important. all these other things. And that's really hard for people. How many times do you deal with people, I get people in my life, like they're running themselves down. And yet they're doing this and they're doing that. It's like, you know, listen, or they're a little bit sick yep. and they don't take the time. Right. And I go, if you don't slow down, you right. don't take a night, you're just going to get yourself really sick Worse. and then everybody's in trouble. Right. 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 It's the old put your own mask on first. People will not put their own, you know, on an airplane, they tell parents, put their mask on first. Because first. you're no good to the kids if you pass out. Right. 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 But right. so many people just keep going and going and going and grinding and grinding and grinding, and right. they don't understand. He, even here at work, it's like people who come in and they're on the verge of being sick. It's like, well, listen, you can take a day off. Right. You can miss a day or two and then come back, or you can stay here and miss two weeks because you get really sick. So there's some interesting psych- psychological phenomenons behind all of that, multiple different things. And, and um, you know, some people won't miss because they're just, you know, that's their – that's how they were, you know, raised. It's, yeah. We don't. We just do everything. We never miss. We trudge through unless we're on our deathbed, right? Right. That's good. But then we have the ones that won't miss because they have like the the martyr syndrome. They're more like, well, uh, yeah. you know, that yep. I'm going to come in the attention seeking more, and you can see it, and it's there, and they won't miss for that, and then they'll get really, really sick. But they'll have shown everyone that they were really sick yep. for four weeks, yep. and then they've got pneumonia, and then they've got, you know, and and so there's that psych, there's a psychological attention seeking behavior that's pulling for people to give them attention, right? Yeah. And then and then the you mother, have, you didn't you didn't shovel my driveway, so I went out and did it, and I'm really sick now. Sick, right? Yeah. Exactly. It's yeah. all your fault. Yeah. It's all <laughs> exactly. Your fault. Yeah. So there's the there's the maneuver, the manipulation yeah. of getting you know what you need. Whatever, you know, the attention. You needed somebody to feel good because likely if we go back and do, you know, the little pipe smoker on the couch, right? Yeah. That says, well, that's because your mom, your, your, your bad mom, as Freud would say, didn't give you the nurturing you needed that gave you the attention the right way. So right. now you're doing this, this thing. But in contemporary times, it's just a person attention seeking and, and needing that. And then you've got people that... Um, that you know they feel guilty they their mindset is that if they miss they're worried about what other people are going to think right and i see that a lot that or if they miss I, they're going to you know, lose i don't want to miss a day because yeah. then they'll think i'm not you know blah 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 and you know invested yeah. or and then they might fire me and all the distortions and the catastrophizing and the awfulizing and all that stuff goes way out into the stratosphere and like off of one day yeah but they're responding like you just said they're responding to not what's in the moment they're responding to what 
has happened historically to them somewhere, yep. and they're just projecting it out onto, well, if it's happened there, it's going to happen everywhere. I so. can't be worthless because everyone thinks I'm worthless. Right. Yeah. Meanwhile, right. the rest of us are at work going, just don't get me sick. <laughs> stay <laughs> that's, stay so home that's a day or two. People come into my office, and I'm like, are you sick? And they're like... Just a little. I'm like, oh, do not get me sick. <laughs> yeah. I'm very good about telling all my patients. I'm like, please do not come if you're sick. If yep. you have a fever, I'd rather you miss. And I, you know, the, yeah. if you've met anyone, they'd be like, she doesn't let us touch the door. No. <laughs> she doesn't <laughs> let us like touch the couch. I don't blame you. Because <laughs> I'm like, I have to run. You know, I have to do things. So that's where I take care of myself. I have to practice what I preach. I'm like, do not come in sick. Yep. And I'm really not going to be mad at you. But that's one of the things I face is people like, I don't want to be, you would be upset with me. I'm like, yeah. I'm here to help you. And right. it's, I'd rather you be healthy than. And I'd healthy. rather not be sick. Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> at the end of the day, Lou, it's all about me. <laughs> all right. You're, you're a daily game face on uh, Facebook. Yes. Where you can find past, past episodes. Yes. Also up on face. Spotify right now. And yeah. it'll be up on all platforms, depending on when you're seeing this. We're working on getting up on all podcast platforms. Yes. So you can uh, take us to work as yes. well and just listen to the program if you want to and uh, contact information for game face consulting um it's kim.lannon at yahoo.com or you can go to gamefaceconsulting.com or you can call me at 781-608-0047 and certainly between now and our next podcast next week anyone that wants to have questions answered or anything certainly go to your game face um daily and uh your daily game face i'm sorry your daily game face and and certainly write me there and i'll be happy to answer those questions and we'll see you all next episode yeah thank you <laughs>